Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation quarterly webinar for the fourth quarter, 2018. We've got an exciting presentation here for you today, along with Paul Grizel and Jamie Ambrosia, who will be briefing on Baldridge Connect, then updates from the foundation, the Baldridge program and Bob Fangmeyer, the Alliance for Performance Excellence, and Brian Lasseter. As a reminder, please keep your microphone on mute during the presentation. You can ask questions through your chat box to the moderator, and we will get those to each of the presenters as they co-present. Today's agenda. And now we'll get started with Paul Grizel and Jamie Ambrosia, who are going to talk to us about Aldridge Connect. Paul, you've got the presentation. Very good, thank you, Al. Hi, everyone. Jamie and I are pleased to be able to be providing some information on the Baldridge Connect program. And as the picture shows, what we're trying to do with this program is increase the size of the pie to find ways to significantly increase the number of organizations who are aware of and using the Baldridge framework. So Jamie and I are gonna be talking about the following today. First, a little more background on Baldridge Connect. Next, an overview of the program and how it works. And third, how you may be able to benefit and how you can help. So a bit more background. Baldridge Connect is a collaborative initiative among the Baldridge Program, the Alliance for Performance Excellence, ASQ, and Baldridge-based consultants. I'll be honest, it isn't where we want it to be yet but we're hoping today's webinar will help us accelerate progress on some important points in the program. First of all, the origin of the Baldridge Connect program was during a meeting of a group of experienced Baldridge consultants the day before the Quest for Excellence conference several years ago. Also at that meeting were representatives from the Baldridge program, the Alliance for Performance Excellence, and ASQ. The discussion revolved around how to increase awareness of the Baldridge framework. Instead of seeing the continued relatively small number of organizations participating in the program, we wanted to come up with a way to <clears throat> increase the size of the pie. In a perfect world, the biggest challenge all of us would face would be how to manage our respective businesses to support the large number of organizations using the Baldridge framework. Our key objective is to increase awareness and understanding of the Baldridge framework, thereby increasing the use of the framework. We know that the Baldridge program itself can't sell their services. And one thing that Baldridge consultants know is that if they can't sell Baldridge, they don't eat. Baldridge consultants are experts at communicating the value of the framework. They may have a core competency in engaging organizations in a performance excellence journey. So we want to leverage that capability. How do we do that? Two ways. First, increase knowledge of the Baldridge framework to organizations with little or no knowledge of Baldridge. And number two, build a referral network to connect organizations looking for assistance with Baldridge-based consultants. Those of us who have years of experience know how an organization just getting engaged with Baldridge often doesn't know how to get started. They have the criteria book, but no knowledge of how to get started. They don't know about ADLI or Let's See, and they may get frustrated with the process early on. We want to be able to provide experienced assistance to those organizations. So let me explain how we want to increase awareness and knowledge. This area has not been fully developed yet, and we need your help in this area. And this is the primary reason for developing Baldridge Connect. Members of Baldridge Connect have committed to speak at various venues to build awareness of Baldridge. This may be industry conferences, member organizations, and other opportunities. Let me give you an example. Many of you may be aware of the American Healthcare Association National Center for Assisted Living's Baldridge-based Quality Award Program. 
ACA NCAL is a member of the Alliance. Last year, they had over 1,200 applicants for this award program at three different levels of recognition, including almost 100 full 50-page applications. Kindred Nursing and Rehabilitation Mountain Valley, a Baldridge recipient from 2016, came up through that program. And the Baldridge framework is helping drive performance excellence in the long-term care industry through this membership organization. Many of the presentations that are done by Baldridge stakeholders are to those who are already on the Baldridge path. For instance, at Quest for Excellence Conference, Alliance member conferences, and other audience that are typically committed to Baldridge. We need to get the Baldridge message out to those who may not have ever heard of the program. We need to find ways to engage with industry conferences and member organizations whose attendees and members could benefit from Baldrige. And that's gonna be the big ask that we have of all of you is to consider what are those organizations, those membership organizations that may not be familiar with Baldrige, but would be a good candidate to, uh, to build awareness. Now I wanna turn it over to Jamie to discuss the second part of the Baldrige Connect program, our consultant referral process. Jamie? Thanks, Paul. Um, pleased to be here speaking with everyone today. As noted by Paul, the second main goal of the Baldrige Connect program was to build a referral network so that we could connect organizations looking for assistance with experienced Baldrige-based consultants. So when we built this program, we had several uh, main tenants in mind that we wanted to put in place. The first one was that we wanted it to be a voluntary program, a program consultants would only join if they saw value in it, and they would opt not to join it if they were not interested. So we wanted them to only join if they were interested and really wanted to participate and to make it a voluntary program. We also wanted to make sure that we had minimum requirements so that any consultant who was in the program we could ensure would be an experienced consultant at the national level, college-based consultant at the national level. So let's take a look at some of those minimum requirements that we have. The first one was that they have national level experience, such as serving as an examiner, a judge, or in another capacity at the national level. The second one is to be knowledgeable in the current version of the Baldrige framework. We wanted to make sure they were current with the Baldrige framework, and they could demonstrate that by going through examiner training or through other mechanisms. But we wanted to make sure that they were knowledgeable in the current version of the Baldrige framework. The third thing is that they have a minimum of five plus years of active involvement, support of Baldrige and or an Alliance member program. We wanted to see some demonstrated commitment over a number of years that showed they were participants and active in supporting and engaged with the national program or with an Alliance member program. We also ask that they provide three references from clients in the past, from the past five years. So we saw some evidence from their clients who they worked with and they got positive referrals and recommendations. Those pieces were minimum requirements that all participants and all the stakeholders that Paul mentioned felt were important and were critical to the program. So every one of those parties and representatives that were involved in developing the program felt they were essential. However, we also realized some consultants might not meet these minimum requirements and might want to participate in the program. So we encouraged those consultants to work with experienced knowledge-based consultants who could serve as mentors, they could partner with them, or they could partner with an alliance member program to help get the experience they need so that they can get into the program. We wanna enable people to get into the program who wanna be in the program. We also wanna keep a minimum level of requirements to ensure the quality and standards. Another key tenet of the program was that we wanted to make sure that certain codes of conduct were followed so that, so every consultant in the program signs a code of conduct and also a consultant partner agreement to do several things. First is to protect the integrity of the Baldrige program and stakeholder intellectual property. Felt so both those things were critical. Secondly, uphold the promise of confidentiality. We wanna make sure that everyone in the program keeps the information that they learn about clients confidential and protected. And lastly, 
we want to ensure that professional conduct is exhibited at all times. So all consultants in the program sign the Code of Conduct and the Consultant Partner Agreement to make sure that they adhere to those principles. And we check to make sure that these standards are being followed by touching base with, with people who contact us for referrals. So we do check on this. So we launched the program in summer of 2017, and we signed up 30 plus Baldrige-based consultants in the program. So we have a good cadre of most of the leading consultants throughout the country, um, some newer in their career, some who have been around longer, but a nice cadre of consultants in the Baldrige Connect program. Now let me give you a brief overview of how the referral process actually works. So if your organization is interested in looking for uh, someone to help you with your performance, to improve your organization's performance, you would contact us. When you contact us, you'd be referred to me, and I would work with you to determine your basic needs and requirements for what you were looking for. What are you trying to accomplish? I would then take that information you provide me, and I would compare it to the information that the consultants in the program provided on their skills and expertise and capabilities, and I would match that up. When I match that up, I would look for about three to five consultants that meet your needs that you would want to contact to get more information on. So these are consultants that could potentially provide the services you're looking for. You would, I would then give you the contact information for those consultants, and I would also let the consultants know that you would be reaching out to them. You would then work directly with the, with the consultants to determine who is the best fit for your organization. And if you happen to find that none of those three to five meet your needs completely, you would reach back out to me and I would look for additional consultants. That has not happened so far in the program, but I would find additional consultants who could meet your needs. I would then also follow up with you to assess progress as you were getting bids from the consultants, as you were looking to select consultants, and as the consultants were delivering services. So I'll stay in contact with your organization. Now let's take a look at some of the benefits of Baldrige Connect for your organization. First and primary benefit for your organization is that you would have access to a qualified network of Baldrige-based consultants. As I mentioned, we have minimum requirements for entry into the program, so you can be assured that any consultant who's in the program is current on the, with the current framework, is also experienced at the national level, and has experience as a consultant to deliver your services. So you have an access of qualified consultants to meet your needs. They have experience in organizational assessments, experience with the Baldrige board process, and as I mentioned, experience with the Baldrige framework and are current in the Baldrige framework. Uh, another benefit is that I would be there as your Baldrige program liaison to assist with finding consultants that meet your needs and requirements. So that process I just described, where I would work with you to match your needs and requirements to the capabilities of the consultants. And the last benefit is that the way the program is structured, there's no added cost to your organization for using the service. There is a revenue sharing model that we have with the consultants in the program, but there's no added cost to you other than uh, contracting with the consultants. Okay, now let's look briefly at the status of the program and some next steps for Baldrige Connect. As Paul noted, the Baldrige Connect program is still, in, still very much a work in progress. We rolled it out in 2017, but it's been slowly moving along since then. And there's still a lot to be done and a lot of uh, upward trajectory for the program. So thus far, in 2018, we promoted Baldrige Connect at our Quest for Excellence conference in the program for the conference and in the talking points for the conference. We also produced a product sheet, a two-page product sheet that we use at conferences where we exhibit and speak at. And so we've promoted it, and that means so far. We also have processed, processed a limited number of referrals, so a handful of referrals so far, to organizations uh, ranging from government organizations to for-profit businesses to other organizations as well. But it's only been a handful of referrals so far. And we certainly know we can do a lot more, and the program was designed to do a lot more. So as we look forward to 2019, we're really looking to increase both the promotion and outreach of the program and to increase the number of referrals. As Paul mentioned and I've touched on, we believe we're early on with this program, 
and that there's a lot we can do. And hopefully this webinar is a first step towards really advancing the program in 2019. Some of the things we'll be looking at is setting up a web page. We'll be looking at increasing our outreach efforts um, in conferences, as Paul mentioned, and really getting the word out about the program. So let's talk about briefly about how you might be able to help us with this effort. And I know Paul touched on this. The first thing is, if you know conferences or uh, individual organizations or association membership organizations or any audiences who would benefit from hearing about the Baldrige framework, and not just Baldrige Connect and needing a referral, but also just benefiting from hearing about the Baldrige framework, we definitely want to hear about who those organizations are and if you can help us reach them, if you have connections within the organization and you would like to connect us up with them. So please do let us know about those organizations, those conferences where you think we could speak in the coming year. If you happen to know an organization that would benefit from a consultant assisting them on the performance excellence journey, or if your organization benefit from working with a Baldrige-based consultant and you're interested in identifying some, you can reach out to us, reach out to me in particular, and we'd be happy to match you up with the consultants in the program and hope you're on your way. Um, so just those are our, our big asks, as Paul said. If you have either of those uh, things, you could reach out to us, you can reach out to me and provide your information. So with that, I'll just close by thanking you for your time today, uh, wishing you a very happy holidays. And our contract information is on this last slide. Please do feel free to reach out to us to learn more about the Baldrige Connect program. If you have questions, to ask your questions. And again, if you have any organizations that we can reach out to, uh, to go speak at, to get in front of, to talk and spread the Baldrige word, we certainly appreciate you providing that to us. And we look forward to hearing from you. So I'll close with that. Thank you and happy holidays. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, we have several questions that have come in and I'll turn over the first one to uh, you and Paul here, which is when do you fully expect that this program will be up and running and fully operational? Um, the, the program is up and running now and is operational. It's more a matter of scaling it, which we want to be doing in the coming year. So by that, I mean, if there is an organization you want us to speak to, to or go out and do outreach events, you can let me know right away. If you uh, have an organization or your organization wants a referral, you can contact me right away. So it is up and operational. It's more a matter of scale and, and growing. Uh, the Paul second one, go, go ahead. I was going to see if Paul had anything. Yeah, no, sorry. Additional. No, we've. Uh... We have, uh, we would anticipate that 2019 would be the year that we become fully functional. The next question is, if I'm a consultant, how do I get on this list with Baldrige Connect? Good question, Al. If, if you're a consultant, uh, you can reach out to me, uh, send me an email with my email address there and let me know you want to participate. And then I will give you the information you need to make sure you meet the minimum requirements and to gather the information we need on your background capabilities so that you can be, be part of the program. So short answer, email me and let me know you're interested. Be glad to hear from you. The next question is, is all this information on Baldrige Connect on the Baldrige Program website? Not yet. It will be added in early 2019. So that's one of the next steps. Jamie, is the um, would the two-page handout be available to people as a yes. as a PDF? Absolutely, I have the two-page handout. If you email me, good good catch, Paul, I'll be happy to email it out. The next question is, will the consultants on the Baldrige Connect list will they be getting preferential treatment of some kind by the program? They, the consultants on the list, if people contact us for a referral, they are the, the names we'll use to give referrals. That is, but beyond that, 
there's no sort of preferential treatment given to these consultants relative to other consultants. The last question I have is, can state programs dial into the Baldrige Connect to help state uh, organizations in their states go uh, connect with a, uh, a consultant? Yes, the state programs can refer organizations to Baldrige Connect to have their, their organizations in their states needs be met. State programs can also set up their own program. If they wanted to set up a Baldrige Connect program, we would give them all the materials we've put together and I would um, instruct them on in how we set up the program. If they wanted to start their own similar program just in their state, they could do that as well. Okay, thank you, Jamie and Paul. That was a great presentation. Um, just as a reminder to everybody on the previous slide and the slides will be posted on the Baldrige Foundation website along with the recording of this webinar, their contact information is on their last slide. So now we're gonna get into the update from the foundation. Uh, this first slide here is just a reminder of our strategy map and what it is that we're trying to get at here at the Baldrige Foundation. Exciting new development, we have a new board member uh, that was recently elected in November that will take the helm uh, one January, and that is Scott Reiner, the CEO of Adventist Health in California. He will be replacing Debbie Collard, uh, who is rolling off the board and retiring. An update on the federal budget process. Uh, we're currently in the middle of FY19 and under a continuing resolution, which is you're watching television, you know as much as we do in terms of how that's progressing, but it looks like that continuing resolution is going to uh, continue to fund the federal government here uh, into the foreseeable future, hopefully into February, uh, just prior to Valentine's Day, February the 8th, I believe it is. And we'll be watching that as we move along throughout the fiscal year. The FY20 budget is currently being developed and we have every um, bit of confidence that the Baldrige program will be in the FY20 budget, which will be delivered to Congress no later than the first Monday in March, or I'm, excuse me, February. A uh, quick update, uh, the FY19 bill does include $2.2 million for the Baldrige program, and the foundation continues to work with members of the Senate Appropriations Committee to ensure that that appropriation goes through and remains in the budget. We're going to see some changes based on the recent elections uh, in the House. We're going to see uh, changes in the uh, chair and ranking positions and the chair of the CGS subcommittee in the House, John Culberson from Texas, lost his reelection bid, so there uh, will be changes in the ranking position there. Uh, Joe Serrano from New York is expected to take over as the chair of the G CGS subcommittee, but until the Speaker of the House is formally in her position, uh, those appointments will not be made. Senator Moran in Kansas continues and will continue to be the chair of the CJS subcommittee in the Senate and Jean Shaheen from New Hampshire will continue to be the ranking member. Uh, and it's also important to remember that we continue to follow up with the full appropriations committee chaired by Senator Shelby from Alabama, uh, as well as continuing to work with all members of Congress through state programs, building grassroots support for Baldrige across the country with all of the key members of Congress that you see here who are members of the CJS subcommittee in the Senate. Again, uh, on the appropriations subcommittee in the House, uh, John Culberson lost his election. We fully expect Robert Adderholt from Alabama to become the ranking and Joe Serrano, the ranking currently to become the chair of the House subcommittee. Uh, this is good for us, both have expressed prior support for Baldrige in the program. And so we're excited about these changes. Just as an FYI, we've already engaged the White House and the foundation has sent off a letter requesting the president to uh, come and be present at the award ceremony or present the awards at the White House sometime this year to our current round of recipients. And we continue to work across the federal government with the president's cabinet to include the new members who have recently been appointed and will soon be appointed uh, in terms of the Office of Management and Budget. We had an exciting uh, CEO roundtable event in Chicago 
a few months ago, and we're continuing to follow up with that. Uh, we're publishing a white paper soon on the event and everything that we've learned from it and working with the American College of Healthcare Executives as well as others to publicize uh, that white paper. Uh, we have future CEO roundtable events on the drawing board right now uh, in all of our business verticals. So in business and in education, uh, as well as additional ones in healthcare. And you'll be seeing five of those in 2019 and as many as seven of those in 2020. As a reminder, the foundation has a radio show at 1 p.m. Eastern time each week on Friday, and that's with uh, Gwinnett County Business Radio X, and you can see the link at the bottom where you can dial into those podcasts and listen to prior ones as well. As an example, Paul Grizel was a guest on two of those uh, podcasts and talked about Baldridge and the future of the Baldridge program. And if you would like to see others uh, in the Baldridge community present on that show, uh, please feel free to send me an email so that we can connect you with them. In addition to that, we encourage blogging on the Leader Dialogue website uh, that's co-hosted with SOAR and the Baldrige Foundation. And you can see that link at the bottom as well. As a reminder, especially this time of year, if you're dialing into Amazon, please choose the Baldrige Foundation under Amazon Smile. We have a tutorial on how to connect to Amazon Smile because each time you have to log on through Amazon Smile versus Amazon. But a portion of what you spend on Amazon benefits the foundation and the entire Baldrige community. And it's easy to do and it costs you nothing. This is a uh, service that the Amazon community provides to uh, 501c3 profits that are registered with them. We were excited to support the Baldrige Fall Conference and acquire sponsors to support the Alliance this year, as well as the combined federal campaign and providing opportunities for all state programs to dial into philanthropy at the federal level within their states. And we are now supporting the communities of excellence in terms of their administrative cost support. So we're giving them uh, as much help as we can too as they continue to promote communities and Baldrige within communities across the country. It's another opportunity. Please remember that Walden University is still offering tuition grants up to $3,000 uh, per grant per person in a number of their programs. And to learn more about that, you can dial into the foundation website and learn more in connecting with Walden University. We still have a limited number of copies of the Baldrige Foundation Journal of Performance Excellence, the 2017 initial version. Uh, if you would like more copies, please contact us and we will be more than happy to ship them out to you. The Foundation Awards Committee has settled on the Foundation Awards for 2018 and I'm proud to announce that the Lifetime Achievement Award will go to Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama, who, uh, if you don't know this, was instrumental in establishing a state program in Alabama uh, back when Baldridge uh, began to catch on in popularity nationwide. And he has been a champion of the program ever since and personally knew Malcolm Baldridge. The Harry Hurts Leadership Award will be going to Dr. Joanne Sternke, uh, many of you know as the former Pilwaukee School District Superintendent. She will be presenting at the Quest for Excellence Conference at the Gaylord in uh, April, so we'll be excited to hear from her. The two Kurt Ryman Baldrige scholarships are going to Dr. Alan Turner and Robin Eckhart, uh, who will both have the opportunity to attend the Baldrige Examiner Training Experience. The Awards for Leadership Excellence this year will go in government to Tommy Gonzalez, the CEO and city manager of El Paso, Texas, and who formerly was the city manager for the city of Irving, Texas, a Baldrige Award recipient, to Congressman Sam Graves from Missouri, Mary Ruth Butler from Mountain Valley, Cascadia, Deborah Larkin Carney, the Vice President of Quality and Patient Safety at Barnabas Health in Idaho, Dr. Glenn Crotty, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Charleston Area Medical Center, Patty Scriba from Vice President of Business Excellence at Advocate Good Samaritan, as well as Allison Young from KNN Management, Bob Pence, the Chairman of the Board and former CEO of Freeze and Nichols, Carrie Hill, the CEO of Mesa in Oklahoma, as well as the former uh, President and CEO of the Oklahoma State Program, 
Dr. Bruce Kentz, the president and CEO of Concordia Publishing House, Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP in Washington, and Dr. James Evans, professor at the University of Cincinnati and former Baldridge judge and examiner. So with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to Bob Fangmeyer, who's going to give us an update on the Baldridge Performance Excellence Program. Bob? Thanks, Al. Just making sure I get my screen up here. All right, uh, good day, everybody. Um, looking forward to the opportunity here to share some important updates with you. And in case you had not heard, um, we announced our recipients for 2018 about a little over a month ago. And we're very pleased to announce that we have a really nice diverse group of award recipients. Two folks from education, the Alamo Colleges District and Tri-County Tech, a nonprofit, Donor Alliance, a healthcare memorial hospital and healthcare center, and a small business integrated project management company, Inc. Uh, from Illinois. We also had two best practice recognition organizations. Uh, the first in leadership, we recognized, the judges recognized Howard Community College in Maryland. And in customer slash patient focus, they recognized Mary Greeley uh, Medical Center in Ames, Iowa. So again, we're very happy with, with the outcome of the judging process and evaluation process from last year and looking forward to this year. Speaking of this year, we have recently released, I think you should have seen, hopefully you all saw uh, the announcement yesterday um, that the new version of the Baldrige Excellence Framework is now available, at least for business um, and nonprofit. The healthcare and education versions will be available in mid-January. The changes in the framework this year focus on several things. One is this concept of business ecosystems. And it's important for you to understand that, you know, business ecosystems is not a new concept, um, but, but what we're doing here is we're recognizing the sort of increasing impact and significance of uh, the larger ecosystem within which a business or a healthcare organization or education organization, whatever type of organization, the ecosystem in which they operate. And we have not added ecosystems into the criteria requirements, but we have added it to uh, some of the content in terms of notes and in terms of uh, the core values in certain places. Um, in the criteria, what we have done though is add some um, references to and considerations for expanding the perspective uh, regarding those requirements to include suppliers and partners, collaborators, customers, and competitors uh, to emphasize the importance of thinking more broadly about the business ecosystem in which the organization operates. Similarly, supply network is sort of an expansion of, of a concept, uh, supply chain. Many of you probably recognize that supply chain really doesn't describe the situation for most organizations these days. There's not a, a singular linkage from one supplier, sub-supplier to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, most organizations today are dealing with more of a network of suppliers, which is important for organizational agility, flexibility, and um, continuing operations in an event of an emergency, et cetera. So we've modified our language to reflect that, and we're no longer talking about supply chains. Instead, we're talking about supply networks. Culture, organizational culture has been an important part of the framework since around, I think, 2000. And this is not a new concept. Um, and I think we all probably would recognize the importance of culture uh, to an organization's success and sustainability. What we have done is we've increased the significance of uh, leadership's role and responsibility in establishing a, a proper culture that will enable and ensure that success of the organization. In terms of security and cybersecurity, this is also not new. As you all probably know, we have recently expanded that uh, in the last version, and we're continuing to do so. Uh, we're increasing some of the, 
the requirements and the commentary around security and cybersecurity to better reflect needs of organizations today. In addition, simplification of the framework is something we've been working on and will continue to work on um, as we're trying to make sure that the framework accomplishes the two primary goals of being that national standard of organizational excellence, but also the most um, user-friendly tool that we can possibly make it. And so this time around, we have made some modifications to uh, decrease the overall sort of volume of the content. We have reduced some of the notes and moved them to commentary. We have also taken some of the examples that were present in the criteria themselves and move them to notes rather than have them as be part of uh, the criteria questions. Speaking of that term, the criteria requirements, we have realized this time around that we had some legacy language that was present that was really perhaps resulting in some uh, unintended consequences with regards to examiners and applicant organizations making an assumption that all criteria questions were critical and were all mandatory. Um, so because that's not the case, and we've been sort of struggling with that challenge, we realized that by calling them criteria requirements, we were perhaps leading people down that path. So instead of calling them criteria requirements, we're gonna call them what they are. They are criteria questions. There are still basic questions, overall questions, and multiple level questions, but they're not going to be called requirements. I can tell you that is already proving to be a challenge in terms of a, a change in our vernacular, uh, but I'm sure we'll all <laughs> get better with time as we work on it together. Uh, and finally, on the cover, you'll see a new tagline. Um, the Baldwin Jackson's framework proven leadership and management practices for high performance. We think that describes a little more clearly why an organization's leader would want to pick this document up and start looking through it and finding out how it can benefit them and their organization. Communities of excellence. Uh, we continue to support this initiative, as I'm sure all of you know. And we do hear from some folks once in a while who will ask, why? Why is Baldridge involved in communities of excellence? Well, to me, it's actually pretty simple, but I want to make sure others understand. One, our purpose is to enhance our nation's competitiveness by defining, recognizing, and fostering excellence among organizations in every sector. And quite frankly, communities of excellence gives us that opportunity almost like nothing else we've been involved in because instead of working with a single organization at a time, the Communities of Excellence Initiative allows us to work with many organizations who are working together to achieve excellence across an entire community. I also happen to think that it is sort of a natural evolution of the systems approach to excellence that Baldridge is all about. Obviously, we talked about the importance of a systems perspective of the organization, we talked about ecosystems a little bit ago. If you take that concept a little bit further, what you're looking at is the fact that the success of a community is dependent upon the various participants working together in a systems approach to achieve the goals and objectives and level of performance uh, that a community is striving to achieve. And obviously by doing all that, we're gonna enhance the program's reach and impact. So a piece of information for you recently, just on the 11th of December, the Baldridge Board of Overseers agreed to the following. They agreed to endorse and support the effort to have Congress approve communities as the seventh category for the Baldridge Awards. It's also, they also have supported the five-year plan that was presented which incorporates the um, all the enterprise partners, the foundation, the alliance, and the Baldrige program as we strive to stand up an effective communities of excellence uh, initiative that will uh, reach across the, the nation and, and help the entire Baldrige enterprise. In addition, they have agreed to support the effort to work 
with Communities of Excellence 2026 and other members of the enterprise to achieve congressional approval, any necessary funding, and implement that five-year plan. Okay. Another activity we've been heavily involved in, and many of you have probably heard me speak about over the past couple of years, is the award process redesign. Now, I want to start by saying we all recognize that the award process has proven to be very effective in identifying role model organizations and providing valuable feedback to applicant organizations. We know this, and we are not willing to make changes that would have a negative impact on the integrity, the effectiveness, or the value of the Baldrige process. But I think we all can also acknowledge that the process from application to feedback report is a heavy burden on really everyone involved. And I think we can also acknowledge that there are some inefficiencies in the process. And for decades, we've made tweaks and minor improvements, generally adding more steps uh, and more resources to try and tackle problems and make things clearer, et cetera. Unfortunately, I think one of the net effects of that wasn't necessarily uh, improvements uh, as much as it might have been adding complexity to the process. So our goals for the redesign were to, one, maintain the integrity and rigor, strive for greater efficiency and use of fewer resources. That includes uh, program resources, examiner resources, applicant resources, et cetera, to create greater value for applicants, examiners, and other stakeholders to produce quicker and easier to not only digest, but also produce feedback. And one of the new components in here that I'll talk about in a minute is a virtual site visit for all applicants. So let's look at the current process quickly here. As most of you probably know, we have essentially a three phase process, independent review, consensus review, and site visit review. But some of you may not realize, depending on how long you've been around, there used to be a judging phase between each of these. Not all Baldrige Award applicants used to receive a consensus review. So there was a judging process between independent and consensus review. Now there is, and there has always been, a judging process between consensus and site visit. And there is, of course, a judging process after site visit to determine which of the organizations should be recommended for the award. That history um, led to sort of the inclusion and maintenance of certain steps in the process that really we determined are not necessary any longer. Because all applicants receive a consensus review, there really isn't a need, wasn't a need for all examiners to do a full independent review like we do today. We don't need to have all examiners do a full evaluation with scoring and commentary, et cetera, if there isn't a judging process between independent and consensus review. So what we looked at was how can we streamline this process and create more value? Well, first, uh, we realized that what we really need examiners to do during the independent phase, all examiners individually do, is to do an effective analysis of the organization's um, uh, maturity of their key processes and key results. So what we've asked them to do in the pilot was to capture what they think they know about the applicant's process and results and what more they think they need to know. There are no identification of strengths or OFIs, there is no scoring, and there's no feedback ready comments at that step. Now, by adding a virtual site visit, which means only that the team will have an opportunity to have direct dialogue with the organization to explore their key processes and results. It's not a virtual site visit in, in the sense where the team will somehow go on site physically. That's why we try to call it virtual, but there was some confusion around that from my earlier presentations. So the opportunity is there for the team to have extended dialogue with the organization to really clarify what they know and what more they need to know. It is only after the virtual site visit that the examiners will do a uh, sort of formal evaluation with findings, scoring, and the production of what will become feedback. 
there will be the traditional opportunity for a judging process after that to determine which of those organizations should receive an on-site visit so that a team can go and really follow through and make sure they know as much as they need to know in order for the judges to make recommendations. So what is shown here is a sample of the revised feedback that we created through the pilot process. I'm gonna point out just a few things. We're not gonna dive into this too deep. I'm already taking up more time than I should. But it's important to recognize that there are strengths and opportunities still for the process, but rather than a well-crafted paragraph that tries to integrate a bunch of components, we decided let's just be straightforward and show the organization exactly what the team thought they saw and why. So what is the finding? And the finding, you could maybe think of it as like the nugget in the current process. What's the finding? What's the evidence for that finding? And the evidence is built out of the observations that the team made during that independent analysis and during that virtual site visit review. So these are the things they know and, the, and, and they will have explored the things that they needed to know during a virtual site visit. When it comes to the opportunities for improvement, you still have findings, you still have evidence, but then there's also a section called potential impact of addressing. And this is again, very direct. You don't need well-crafted sentences. Um, the hope is that it can be much more clear as to why this is important to the organization. We also show not just the scoring range, but the rationale for the scoring. We wanted the organization to understand exactly what the team saw and what that made them believe about the organization's maturity. And we also think that by showing the rationale, uh, there's a little more accountability for the team as well to make sure that they have done a really good job of uh, considering all the evidence, um, their, their comments, et cetera in their justification for the scoring range. Some comments from the examiners and from the applicant. I'm not gonna read these to you, but let me, I will just say that both the team members who went through the pilot process and the applicant organization were very pleased with this. Uh, one of the things we tried to do was allow the process to evolve as we went. Um, that was intentional. Uh, we didn't want to assume we knew exactly what this should look like. We wanted uh, the process to sort of be developed um, as we went along. Because of that, some of our next steps include doing some additional pilots. We're going to run another pilot. We're also rolling this out to some state and regional programs so that they can pilot it with us and for us. Um, once we sort of settle in on what the process really is going to look like, uh, there's a pretty massive change management process that's gonna have to happen. And there's a lot of aspects to this, the changes to the process itself, um, what sort of evaluation tool do we need to have to facilitate it? What are the changes to examiner training, et cetera? So there's a lot that'll have to go into this, um, but we're excited about the opportunity. We definitely believe it saved time. Uh, we believe it improved the value and we believe it made the uh, process both more streamlined and shorter cycle time, but also uh, better for the applicants and the examiners. And that's all I had. Al, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, great, thank you, Bob. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Lassiter, the chair of the board for the Alaska Performance Excellence. And uh, Brian, it's up to you. Thank you, Al. Thanks, everybody. Um, good afternoon or good morning, as the case may be. I'll keep my comments brief, just have a couple of slides of update for the Alliance. And then, Al, I think you want to open it up for final questions. Um, to remind you all, many of you on the call probably know who the Alliance for Performance Excellence is. For those of you that don't, uh, we are a 501c3 consortium of all the 29 programs serving all 50 states, the local, regional, and sector-based, Baldrige-based programs across the nation. As you can see some of the statistics there, we're, we're fairly large in our reach with 1,500 annual applications a year, 160 of them, the full 50-page applications. Trained over 1,700 examiners last year and, and uh, serve over 18,000 members 
our combined budget is about $9 million when you add us all together and about 40 to 43 FPE. So pretty significant scale. Some, uh, an update since the last webinar. Um, a couple of things. We did successfully host the Baldridge Fall Conference in Denver a couple of months ago. Several of you on this call probably were in attendance. We're pleased with the outcome. Over 300 attended, which is a pretty significant growth from last year's Baldridge Fall Conference. I want to thank again the Wisconsin Center for Performance Excellence and the Rocky Mountain Performance Excellence programs for co-hosting the event. And we're excited to to host next year's event in the fall in Nashville. And we're very, very close to announcing the date. I thought I might have it today, but uh, ink is not yet drying on a contract. So we'll uh, check your, your uh, email inboxes right after the holidays for that announcement. But it should be an equally uh, powerful conference. I want to welcome a few new supporting members to the Alliance. For those of you that know, we uh, all 29 program members are the Boulder Space programs that that have a mission to advance Baldridge within our state region or sectors. We've opened up our membership to uh, non-program members. We're calling them supporting members. And these are other inter interested parties in our mission uh, and st stakeholders. And, and we welcome the first three, Mike Belter, who some of you on the call may know, is an individual, Stratex Solutions, and Walden University, who Al mentioned earlier is partnering with the foundation. They're also partnering with the Alliance. They have a Baldridge-based consulting capstone program uh, that's a few years old now and really thriving. It's, it's um, experiencing some great growth and I think it is a, a powerful opportunity for um, not only their students, but the organizations that are receiving great Boulder Space feedback through that program. So welcome to the three new supporting members. And I think last time I mentioned two strategic task forces that the Alliance had uh, launched this summer and fall. They continue to make progress. Um, perhaps by the next call, we'll give you an update on, on some of the conclusions. They're right now in the middle of their work. But the first one is to um, create guidelines for lower levels of tiered award programs across the Alliance. We do have standards for our top level awards uh, that the Alliance and the Baldur's program agreed to, gosh, about six years or so ago now. And these are creating some uh, guardrails and guidelines for the, the earlier uh, stages of, of recognition within all of our programs to try to promote some consistency there. So we have a team working on those uh, guidelines and, and hopefully their work will be done the first half of next year. And the other team is um, taking an inventory of services across the Alliance member program so that we might be able to transport them, scale them, share them across the independent 29 programs. Our sense is there's a lot of great resources and services available, but within pockets of the Alliance that could be uh, expanded for, for greater use and greater, greater benefit throughout the Alliance. So watch for more information on that task force as well. And that you know, concludes my brief remarks, Al, and saving about five or six minutes for some Q&A. Uh, thanks, Brian. Actually, we do have a few more questions that have come in, and these both center on uh, Baldrige Connect. So these will be for either Jamie or for Paul to, uh, to field. The first one is, in the past, the Baldrige program would forward contacts to the regional programs. Uh, as potential clients called the program and look for help. Uh, will this still continue or um, will they strictly be turned over to Baldrige Connect? I'll field that one, Al, thank you. We still do forward contacts to state programs. So when we get organizations that contact us, we'll speak with them to determine what would best meet their needs. And sometimes that will be uh, through Baldrige Connect to the Baldrige Space Consultants. Other times it'll be to the state programs uh, to meet their needs. And I would say that the majority still go to the state programs that come in because th that would best meet their needs. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Uh, the second one is, um, it seems like this may take business away from the regional Baldridge Alliance programs. Is that true or is that false? The reason we established the program and work with the Alliance, and Katie Rawls was on our planning team along with Paul and I, was to make sure that, that we didn't do that, Al. And so that's why we encourage Alliance programs to stand up their own Baldrige Connect program or another referral program if they want, and why we still refer business 
to the Baldrige programs. This is a more focused uh, referral program really for the few organizations that are looking for assistance with a national level Baldrige uh, consultant who could benefit them. So we still partner with the Alliance very closely. And I'd like to address that also. Um, Baldrige consultants are not able to be successful unless we work with our state, our regional program. And, um, and I'd like to think that the regional programs would feel like working with Baldrige consultants is something that, uh, that helps the ultimate client, the, the, the organization that's an applicant or is using the, um, the framework. Um, I, I use the analogy, the, the well-worn analogy of a three-legged stool of I can't do, I can't be as successful as I want to be as a consultant without working with that state program. And, you know, I'd like to think that the state programs would look at the consultants and say, these people are helping us advance our purpose also, both of which are, um, are assisting that user of the framework. Okay, well, thanks. That concludes our questions. I uh, just want to wish everybody who's currently online with us a happy holiday season and a safe and healthy and prosperous new year. Our next foundation webinar for the first quarter of 2019 will be March the 28th, 2019 at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thanks again to all of our presenters. And thank you to everybody out there who are helping us to continue each and every day to bring performance excellence to organizations across the United States. Have a great holiday season and goodbye.